Good morning. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, optimizing nitrogen management on organic and biologically intensive farms. So to get the most production, by uh, organic farmers and all farmers are investing a um, tremendous amount of effort into um, ground preparation, tillage, planting, transplanting, cultivation, irrigation. All of these practices take time and money and resources in order to produce a good crop. And so to really maximize or optimize yield from this effort, um, sufficient nitrogen fertility is required. And this, of course, in organic sources can be uh, quite expensive. To come up with that optimum nutrient management or nitrogen management uh, plan, there's several things that should be looked at. First is um, the plant nitrogen requirement. So we're basically going to try to solve through this equation how much fertilizer should we apply. So first we want to look at the plant nitrogen requirement and then subtract from that different credits that will reduce that amount of fertilizer. So how do we go about this? Well, for the nutrient uh, nitrogen requirement, we can look at nutrient management guides. Most of these have not been written for organic uh, producers. Um, for example, this one from out of Oregon State says in there a total application of 150 to 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre is suggested. So they're assuming probably some nitrogen contribution from the organic matter, but it's a black box really. Um, there's other good, this is a publication for organic growers and, and kind of grouping crops into low, medium, and high feeders. Um, that's, a, that's a great approach just to, you know, you shouldn't be kind of going out to your field and giving everything the same recipe. So this at least can help people get into different categories. And then um, Oregon State, uh, the cover crop and organic fertilizer calculator is a great tool and it's been expanded, it, it, in, um, it's been expanded uh, to work in some different environments like Idaho at this point. And uh, they're looking at the contribution from amendments and other organic fertilizers because they're not all going to be available. All the nitrogen in that organic fertilizer is not going to be available. So this tool is really helpful at estimating how much will be available or if you apply an amendment in that year, how much is going to be available. And then also if you've got a nice big vetch cover crop, you know, how much nitrogen are you actually going to get from that? So the organic fertilizer and cover crop calculators made uh, great steps and, and given people a tool in that area. And so then the final piece is this nitrogen oops, from organic matter. And this is a tricky piece to get our heads around. The, some labs, soil testing labs, will provide the ENR, estimated nitrogen release number. Um, there are some specialized predictive tests. And then there's also the approach of guess, observe, and test. And actually, I think this is a great approach, too, because it's the testing part at the end and the observing and uh, getting to really know that site's, that site specific and how your site works. But um, looking at these estimated nitrogen release, they're usually just a straight multiplication of soil organic matter. Um, this is a Nebraska grain recommendation, 20 times the percent soil organic matter minus one from uh, Brady and Weil soil science textbook. You know, this is in there. Uh, you take your org the percent organic matter and you assume you can figure out how much uh, carbon is in there and then assume some mineralization rate. So, for example, using this equation, if you had two and a half percent soil organic matter, you would come up with a contribution of 62.5 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So these are just assuming that um, you've got this organic matter number. So now you know how much nitrogen you're going to get. The problem with that is that organic matter is taking all of the different organic matter and, and putting it into one bucket. And we know that that's not how organic matter works in the soil. Um, the kinetics, that, that mineralization of the organic matter, depends on how available and also the quality of the material in the soil. So this is an approach that looks at um, fractioning organic matter. So this is the entire soil here. And just through the top, you can do sort of a complete fractionate or a complete dispersal of all the um, aggregates and everything. And then you would end up with at least two fractions there, the mineral associated organic matter that's kind of tightly bound to the surfaces of clay particles. And then this particulate organic matter, which may be more available. Um, the mineral and the mineral associated is going to be limited. So how much mineral associated organic matter you can build in your soil is going to be limited by that surface area that you have. And then another pool is aggregate um, organic matter that's trapped in aggregates. And that's sort of stable until aggregates get broken apart through tillage and other activities. And then that aggregate organic matter is going to contain both uh, palm, particular organic matter, and uh, mineral associated. So this may be another approach. Um, the guess, observe, and test tool, we want to, we really encourage this and in, in, we get a lot of rain in the winter in the Pacific Northwest. So any nitrate that's left in that soil at the end, so if you do over apply nitrogen, you're going to have nitrate left, it's going to be leached out. And so we want to definitely, we encourage people to do their soil testing in the fall to really get this number and be able to evaluate how well they, they did. 
Um, so you don't want to be in the low category necessarily because then you're going to, you know, you'll notice that probably in your plants, but you certainly don't want to be um, in the excessive or, or very excessive, which we sometimes see. So we're doing a study over two years, 2016, 2017. Um, this is a SARE uh, Professional Plus Producer Grant. So there's um, five, five farms involved. And uh, in different, three farms in Western Washington would be the Maritime Pacific Northwest and two farms in Central Washington. And what we did is look, we're trying to evaluate the soil, look at the soil um, for nitrogen mineralization potential, and then actually do a fertilizer experiment on that farm. And we chose broccoli in the high, uh, high feeder category. Um, so in the first year we did 0, 60, 120, 180, and 240 pounds of nitrogen per acre applied as a feather meal. And as you'll see, that was not enough. Uh, so in 2017, we did those same rates and then added two additional rates. And just for a little bit of context, when I interviewed the farmers in this study, they were applying like 30 to 40 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So we, we thought we were there with the 240. We did a randomized complete block design at each site with three replications. We did in-season nitrate testing. One other thing we're looking at is this quick nitrate test. So we did hundreds of lab nitrate tests and then we did hundreds of quick nitrate tests. So I'll show the results of that as well. And this would be like a mid-season check-in. So we didn't do any side dressing, but this could be a future uh, direction or study would be the concept of coming in in the middle and putting in more nitrate if needed. So some of the predictive tests we looked at are the Haney test and this combines ex uh, weak acid extracted mineral nitrogen with that um, Solvita CO2 burst, so 24 hour CO2 production. We did an aerobic incubation. Um, this is in uh, for seven, well for 42 day aerobic incubation at 22 and 35 degrees C. Um, and then we tested the soil at seven, 14, 21 and 42 days. And then we did an anaerobic incubation, which is sort of a, a classic uh, nitrogen mineralization potential test. This is the Solvita, which is part of the uh, Haney test. And the Haney test, they'll, they'll actually tell you this is your nitrogen potential that you're going to get. This is uh, the soil in the bag test. I don't, Dan Sullivan at Oregon State has been instrumental in um, developing this test. And um, the, this is the an, uh, aerobic incubation. So pretty, pretty simple, just testing. Um, uh, nitrate uh, ammonia at, at or nitrogen nitrate and ammonia at different um, time periods. These are the sites. Uh, um, so there's there's five sites. I'm going to call them sites one through five, and then the 16 means 2016, and 17 is 2017. At the at we use the same farms at at each year, but then they just move to a different you know part part of their farm for the study. So we had two in the semi-arid region in central Washington, three in the maritime Pacific Northwest, um, days to harvest. So we had mostly sandy soils. One soil was a silt loam. This, when you're doing on-farm research, you want to control things, but then you want to also let the farmer do things. So one of the farms is a, the smallest farm. Um, they plant their broccoli pretty tight and we didn't, I didn't really control for that. But so all the other farms ended up with about the same spacing and everything, but this one farm, um, they plant in no special way. So we let them roll with that in 2016. <laughs> and then in 2017, we controlled that a little bit more. Um, it's on-farm research, so pests and disease. Um, we lost two sites uh, this year and actually lost one site in 2016 as well. Just there were so many plants missing from the experiment, we could not really do a proper analysis of it. So we looked at some basic soil analysis too before the study. PH, so in Eastern Washington, we've got pretty basic soils. Western Washington, um, pretty acidic soils. Some of them have done a good job of liming over time. This would be nitrate, just, we, we did this preseason test about six weeks before broccoli would be planted. So you would go out six weeks before, get your test, and then hopefully be able to act on that information. Um, not really phosphorus limited. Some you can see a history of um, dairy manure application. So a lot of phosphorus uh, in those sites and more organic matter. We looked at uh, organic matter, then we looked at total organic carbon, and we looked at um, palm. And I haven't gotten too far with this analysis yet, just uh, basically last night scratching my head on this, but um, one thing I did see is, so this site had sort of, you know, middle range of organic carbon and then low in the percent of that carbon as palm. And then this site is sort of the middle range and maybe a little bit um, higher. So 
But in general, the palm tended to follow the carbon, so high carbon, high palm. These are the predictive test results. So the Haney test, this is um, the Solvita number, and then this is the combining to say this is the amount of nitrogen uh, we predict. Um, this is 2016 data. And then the soil in the bag um, results are here, so a little bit of a range there. And then the seven-day anaerobic um, incubation. And we did the three reps at each site. Um, 2017, the Haney tests are in, but I haven't got the data yet for the incubation and the, anaerob the aerobic and anaerobic incubation. Okay, this is the nitrate quick test, and it's pretty simple. Uh, soil and water, deionized water mixed together. Um, you need to filter it slightly to get a good reading, and that takes about, well, this takes maybe five minutes for water to sort of passively filter through there. And then just with a dropper onto the little strip, wait one minute and then read the strip. And so this is an exciting thing that a farmer could do really, you know, on the back of a pickup truck, um, get a result pretty immediately. And pretty good results from that, so a strong correlation. It, the um, quick end test overestimated a bit compared to the lab test, so this is a one-to-one -one line, which if we were getting exactly the same results from both tests, they would, they would be lined up right away, or lined up exactly so. Um, Good predictive tests, but a little bit um, consistently uh, overestimating. Okay, so this is the market weight in 2016. And you can see that there's quite a um, different reaction to nitrogen. Um, there were one site, what, what we're looking at here, what we're trying to do in a fertilizer study like this is fit, um, or one method is to fit a linear to plateau methods, so there should be a plateau, and this is a linear to pl plateau, and this is a quadratic to plateau method. So two of the sites fit those uh, models, two of the sites did not, they were strictly linear, um, which gave us the indication that we needed to look a little bit more deep or further out in terms of nitrogen application. But you can see what's going to be important here is that linear part of the, what is that response to nitrogen? And the larger that, the greater the slope, the more uh, valuable more nitrogen would be in that case. And potentially that could be related to the nitrogen um, mineralization potential of the soil. In 2017, with the extra rates, we, we were able to fit plateau models to all of the sites that didn't die due to <laughs> um, pest and disease. Um, and then also you're, at this point we're able to calculate uh, that what is the value of nitrogen at that plateau, so 297, 457, and 210. So I figured we were probably pretty close to that plateau last year, but if you don't go beyond it, you can't really model it. Um, so it turns out we're, we were pretty good. Okay, so I took an attempt um, at sort of an economic analysis of this, of this. What is the value of that organic matter in the um, soil and I did this by adding you know the cost of the fertilizer um, but the other interesting thing here so this is the value of the organic matter um, the other interesting thing is what is that potential sales from adding a lot of nitrogen and I think this sort of gets us to think about the fertility versus the productivity so why were some sites more productive than others um, the plant spacing turned out to be very important so the smaller farm that plants more tightly they saw a huge response to nitrogen um, and then the other things, it could be um, overwatering. So the nitrogen efficiency, like we're putting the nitrogen out there, but it may not be efficiently being used if it's being leached from watering, or just other um, production practices. Or maybe it's something in the soil that we're not looking at um, other than nitrogen, sort of limiting that productivity. So you're not going to get the same response uh, everywhere, but there is, is value to that. Um, nitrogen. Another important thing to look at, I think, is sort of the y-intercept um, production at zero. So that you know that gets strictly to that soil contribution, um, and and some of the soils have, and they all had pretty pretty decent production at, at zero. Okay, so also importantly, what is uh, left over? Um, here we see uh, this is 28 days. So with the there's a fertilizer response, and I don't have this for 2017, but for 2016. You can see that fertilizer response for nitri nitrate at 28 days. But um, so we're getting pretty high nitrate um, at, at 28 days, uh, you know, up to 150 pounds per acre at one site. But then um, by the post-harvest, we were well below, this would be that threshold that we would consider to be 
high nitrate when we're doing that test. So um, the nitrate was getting used um, by the broccoli or, or removed from the environment. So just to recap with these lines, I want to show here the, um, this is what the farmers from these two sites would have typically applied. This is their typical application rate. So some benefit for sure from um, applying nitrogen. And just to recap, uh, we saw a range of predictive tests. So 11 to 71 pounds suggested with the Haney, um, 2.7 to 8.3 pounds of nitrogen per day with the aerobic test and 9 to 113 uh, parts per million with the anaerobic incubation. In 2016, only two nitrogen plateau values were modeled. And in 2017, we modeled 210, 297, and 470, 457 pounds of nitrogen as the sort of plateau rate. And looking at what, what of those predictive tests had the most, uh, made the most sense, um, it seems to be the aerobic incubation. Again, I don't have this for 2017 yet, but with the aerobic incubation, these um, two sites that had the uh, lowest aerobic incubation had the highest rate of increase with nitrogen. And th this test um, sort of fell out better than any of the others um, in that respect. And then the other piece of that, of course, is the um, plant spacing on, on this farm. So it had relatively sort of mid-range mid of, of incubation mineralization potential, but then tight spacing and, and a strong response to nitrogen. Again, this was a SARE Professional Plus Producer Grant, and so thankful to them for that. And thanks to Oxbow Farm, Cloudview Farm, Kearsop, and Plum Forest Farm for their contributions. Thank you.